Every two minutes, a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States. Uh, breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in women, and nearly 42,000 women will die of the disease this year. These are frightening statistics, but there is a lot of work being done to treat and beat breast cancer. Today we're highlighting the stories of two breast cancer survivors, ABC7 anchor of Roz Varon and Pam Henson, who is with the Sun-Times. She's the media senior VP of sales and marketing. We'll then hear about the advances in breast cancer research from UChicago Medicine Cancer and Chemotherapy Researcher Dr. Eileen Dolan and Dr. Carolyn Brzezinski of the American Cancer Society. As always, we'll take your questions and comics, comments as we talk to our guests here on At the Forefront Live. First of all, welcome to the program. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And if you can, uh, Pam, just uh, we're going to start with you yes. and have each one of you kind of introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about uh, you know why you're here and how you started and uh, with your 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 journey through uh, cancer. Right, great. Um, Pam Henson. I am the senior VP, as you said, of sales and marketing for the Chicago Sun Times. Um, enjoyed three decades in media all across the country, um, and started my cancer journey in uh, Minnesota at the age of 44. Uh, was diagnosed with leukemia, uh, APL leukemia, and uh, immediately did three months of intensive chemotherapy and uh, was declared cancer-free after seven years statistically, and I got to fire my oncologist. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, four months later, I had been getting uh, regular mammograms, and there was early detection of uh, stage one breast cancer. So I then went through breast cancer and am a survivor of seven years. Well, I like how you said that you were getting regular mammograms, yes. and early detection is very, very important in all Very, very important. In fact, um, I, they had put me, because of issues of dense breast tissues and um, the leukemia incident prior, that I was every six months going, and uh, first six months, lumpectomy, mm -hmm. and then they really were watching it, and in 18 months I knew and got it stage one and had a mastectomy and uh, are living every day as a blessing. So. Fantastic. And Roz, I don't know that we really need an introduction for you because I think <laughs> most people probably will recognize you. But uh, thanks for doing this today. And you know, one of the things that's I think very exciting about both of you, uh, and, and Roz, you certainly have a very public platform, but the fact that you're out there advocating I think is just so important and um, hats off to you because I think you. you know it's a tough story to tell first of all, but it's an important story to tell. And if you can kind of start us a little bit with you know your journey as well. You know, my sister is a two-time breast cancer survivor. And I had been getting mammograms every year because of that. And uh, in 2006, I was on vacation. And um, I was one month away from my annual mammogram. And I was in the shower, felt this lump under my arm, and knew this was not a good thing. Yeah. So came back from vacation, went to the doctor immediately. They did a mammogram and they found the tumor in my lymph node, yeah. did not see anything in the breast. Mm. Interesting. Okay? So we had to do a sonogram, an mm -hmm. ultrasound, yeah. and there they saw it. It was hiding underneath the nipple, mm -hmm. and that's why it didn't show up on the mammogram. Yeah. So then we had to do a whole barrage of tests, and we went through bone scans, CAT scans, brain MRIs, and ultimately found that it had traveled to my liver, so I had metastasis to the liver. So my initial diagnosis of breast cancer, stage four. Yeah. And knowing that I was going to have to take time off of work, um, I, I prepared a statement because I was so emotional at that time, I really couldn't talk about it on the air. Sure. So I prepared a statement, and uh, at the time, Judy, Sue, and Jose Sanders were the anchors. Tracy Butler was there, of course. And, and they read it, and I, I remember everybody being so teary-eyed, but mm -hmm. I, I was very positive even then mm -hmm. about fighting this. My daughter was only 10 at the time. and. The response that I got from viewers, from the public, was so strong and so supportive that it really gave me a lot of strength to move forward with this, and I felt it. I really needed to pay it forward, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why I am so vocal about this. I'm such an advocate for things like early detection mm -hmm. and taking care of yourself. Well, and, and you know, it, and it's very evident for both of you by you doing this because this we didn't have to convince either one of you. you know, this was <laughs> no. this was an easy uh, easy sell from our standpoint to right. have you come on and you guys very graciously agreed to do that. But it, but it is a very personal thing and, and each person is different and and that's certainly understandable. But um, from both your standpoint, it's it's important to get the word out and let people know. And you know it was interesting, Roz, because you mentioned that. It wasn't initially a mammogram. You discovered this yourself. You mm -hmm. just, you, and, and again, I think that 
stresses the importance of self-exams. So important. Knowing yourself yes. and, and, and being aware of things and then not being afraid to go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people will reach out to me and they'll say, I don't know what to do. I'm afraid. I don't, I, I don't want to tell anybody. I'm a private person. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that because I'm giving them a platform, people can come to me and you know reach out to me on social media. Mm -hmm. I am able to them point them in a different direction or send them to the American Cancer Society or send them mm -hmm. to the hospital or wherever they need to go and give them the resources that they need. That to me is a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we're working on, Pam, and, and you're a, a big part of this is our I don't know if you call it a partnership. There's several mm -hmm. groups involved, but it is a partnership with the American Cancer Society. Sun Times, ABC7, of course, U Chicago Medicine, and it's to get the word out. And we're also encouraging people to share their stories of yes. cancer survivorship. Uh, you can jump on the Facebook page, and, and, and some of those stories are very touching. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, first, for one thing, I think it's, it's nice for people to be able to share, but it's mm -hmm. also nice for people to be able to read that hear about other people's struggles and I think people gain strength from that. I don't Absolutely. know if you feel that same way but yeah it, I, I think um, Roz said it beautifully that it's you know we've both been given yours much larger than mine um, media voices and, and platforms to do of good yeah. and um, you know in the 14 years that I've been on the cancer journey you know every opportunity the the amazing opportunity with UC Med and the Sun Times uh, turning National Mo Mammography Day uh, next Friday October 18th yeah into a pink paper where we're fundraising for cancer research. That's the, that's the end result of what you want to have gone through your own journey with, is how do you make it an easier journey for someone else that that's has right. to go through that's it, right. or, or make it a journey that cannot happen. <laughs> right. So I'm intrigued by this pink paper. The whole paper is going to be pink. <laughs> the whole paper will be pink, um, <laughs> and we will be out talking it. I see that. That's going to be neat. You're going to be selling so buy a paper. <laughs> okay. yeah, absolutely. For a good cause. No, that's fantastic. So. Talk to us about, uh, you know, and, and uh, Roz, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on this. As you went on this, this cancer journey, and, and I imagine at first it was very scary. Of course. Um, and then how has it changed your outlook on life? I mean, you, you've got to look at things a little differently now, I would imagine. Or maybe not. You're a positive person, so maybe that's <laughs> you're, you're just always you positive. Say that. Yeah. You know, people ask me that all the time. Has cancer changed you? And, and I really have to say, no, it hasn't. Um, there are th certain things that I will look at a little differently, sure. and, and Pam and I were talking about this, that every day is a blessing, yes. every, single every single day. day. But I am a positive person, mm -hmm. and I know that there, there are studies that have been done about positive attitudes and how that, that, that increases and boosts your immune system, and your immune system is what you need to be strong to, in my case, because I'm stage four, mm -hmm. to keep it from coming back. Because once it's traveled through your body, I mean, it can come back, you know, any time. Yeah. So, I, I am a positive person, and that's never going to change. Yeah. Pam, has this changed your outlook at all? Uh, I really would 150% agree with Roz. Um, what I found was, and I, I'm sure we share this too, when you're a very strong individual in personality, you have to, in the cancer journey, you have to start letting others do for you. You oh. have to rely, your, your medical, every, every single medical person that you're dealing with, nurse, doctor, nutritionist, uh, uh, surgeon, becomes your immediate family. And it's so important that you combine your family, your friends, your faith, and this new family of, uh, of you know, doctors that are there for you to help you get through this. And very similar to Roz, every day is a blessing. Um, every single day is a blessing. That's so true what you're saying, though, because we're so used to, you know, <laughs> taking care of everybody else and doing everything else, and you, you don't take a minute to step back and take care of you. So you have to let other people in and let other yes. people help. And, and I strongly, strongly advise people to, when they're first diagnosed, Jim, you were asking me that had to be really scary. Yeah. That's the scariest thing about mm -hmm, this sure. thing. When, when you are first told those words, you have cancer, mm -hmm. you feel like you've been sucker punched. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you can't even catch your breath. So you, you have to take a step back. You have to come up with a plan. You have to let yes. others help you. Once you get past that, once you have a plan, then you can start moving forward and you feel like you have control. Mm -hmm in a situation that really is kind of out of your control. What a wonderful segue you each have given me. It's like you guys have done <laughs> this before, but it's the, the name of, the, uh, of our effort is Together We Answer Cancer. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this just shows how important it is to, to have that, that family, that team, that support group, but have you know, 
that group of people that is supporting and it's just going to be critical as you go through the the whole process and the journey and and uh, I'm glad you both brought that up that's fantastic yeah. so um, I've got to ask for advice so if there are people out here watching this right now and I'm sure there are that are, are facing their own um, their own challenges with cancer what advice would you give them and Pam let's start with yeah. you. yeah um, definitely what I would would share is to really really know your body and get to know anything that seems indifferent um, or not the normal to have those checked out. Um, that happened with me with, uh, I had a petechia under the skin bleed. My husband had been a paramedic and said, you're checking that out. And uh, 36 hours later, I was in chemotherapy for uh, acute leukemia. Same thing with, um, with breast cancer. You just, you have to know your body. Amazing story that, that Roz in self-detection yeah. uh, is incredibly, incredibly important. And, um, and just the attitude. The attitude is everything. So Roz, what would you tell someone coming to you looking for advice? Okay, because this happened to me, get a second opinion, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Because the doctors are there to work for you, mm -hmm. and if you are not happy with what you're hearing or you're not sure about it, you need to find somebody else. And again, don't have that knee-jerk reaction. I had a knee-jerk reaction, and I went through two rounds of chemo. By the time I found the doctor, the oncologist who was right for me, and she said, well, if you'd come to me first, I would have never put you on that chemo. You would have never lost your hair. Yeah. You, you know, you wouldn't have gone through chemo-induced menopause. That was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I digress. Get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hugely important. That's fantastic. So as we, we move forward with this effort, we're going to have the, the paper out week from Friday. Friday, October correct? 18th. So that'll be neat. We're doing a lot of activities with ABC7 and those are oh, yeah. so much fun and so exciting so far. And I just I, for, I just want to thank both of you because you. It's, it's really powerful to have somebody who's been through it tell their stories and be advocates for people. And you two certainly are. Thank, thank you. you. So that's great. It's an honor. We're going to watch a little video here of one of our cancer survivors and then we're going to come back with a couple of researchers here in just a moment. Uh, just randomly um, had felt some pain and uh, was able to feel something um, near my chest wall that didn't seem normal and um, I didn't automatically assume that it was breast cancer but I knew it was something that I should get checked out. My f initial thoughts were that I was going to die, that this is something that um, was just an awful thing that I wouldn't be able to necessarily get through the way that I have. Because I, I have um, you know, friends who have gone through this and have done some research and had treatment here and recommended um, the University of Chicago. Dr. Olapade just was a, a wonderful spirit um, from our initial meeting um, throughout treatment. She was able to balance out, you know, weighing risks and talking about very serious consequences or serious, you know, side effects, but also balance that with just a very positive outlook and just made me feel still human, not just a clinical relationship. So I had to really think hard about what's the best treatment for this young woman who has a lot of life ahead of her and who is also very scared. So what I have to do is to be the bad cop, right? And say, you know what, we need to treat this more aggressively because it has these features that if we don't take care of it, we're gonna regret it because then it can come back. And then we came to a shared decision and she was gonna get chemotherapy. We're gonna avoid the chemotherapy that could weaken her heart. But then we knew that whatever chemotherapy she got wasn't gonna be a cakewalk, right? She's a you know, high functioning professional who wanted to be able to go to work and then she has children. When I met with Dr. Alapade, she was very hopeful, um, made me realize that you know, this, this wasn't gonna kill me. This is, uh, this is just uh, a matter of finding the right course of treatment. I think uh, we need to remove the stigma about people getting cancer 
uh, more people need to get treated early because fear can make you paralyzed and too often people get paralyzed and they don't get the cancer treated when in fact it could be curable. To really become an advocate for yourself, um, learn as much as you can and really feel comfortable with who you're partnering with as your, as your healthcare partner uh, because you need to really feel comfortable and have a trusting relationship with them and uh, you know, that helps keep you hopeful and keeps your, your attitude positive. And welcome back. We have a couple of researchers joining us for this portion of the program. We want to remind our viewers, if you want to ask a question of one of our experts, just type it in the comment section of the uh, Facebook page, and we'll try to get to as many as possible as we can for the rest of the show. So joining me is Dr. Eileen Dolan from UChicago Medicine. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. And Dr. Carolyn Brzezinski from the American Cancer Society, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. So let's start off with, uh, Dr. Dolan, I'm going to start with you and talk about some of the research that's being done and some of the advances in breast cancer and breast cancer research, and what are some of the exciting things uh, that are going on? Well, as you probably are aware, breath, breast cancer deaths have declined over the last several decades, and much of this is due to new treatments for ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. But over the last year, there's been really exciting advances uh, for triple negative breast cancer. And the reason this is important is because we know that triple negative breast cancer is very aggressive, it's very hard to treat, and it's more common in African Americans. Um, so over the past year, there's been FDA approval for immunotherapy, uh, as well as PARP inhibitors. Uh, these are being combined with chemotherapy, and so it's a very exciting time for this particular uh, type of cancer. <clears throat> Dr. Brzezinski, I, I read some statistics at the very start of the show that were, quite frankly, a little startling when you hear them on the surface. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a large population in the United States, but still, it, it, it's very concerning. But those numbers are going down, so that's yes. positive. What would be, in your opinion, some of the things that you could attribute the, the decrease to? I think the decrease is due to both the uh, uh, increased screening, people going out and getting screened, because if we can detect cancer early, then there is a much more positive result, much better mm -hmm. outcomes if you can detect the cancer early. And then of course, mm -hmm. as Dr. Dolan mentioned, there's been advancements in treatment. And so we are seeing this steady decline in the mortality rates um, uh, for breast cancer. Uh, so much so that over the last, between 1989 and 2017, over 376,000 fewer women died of breast cancer. That's, so. a, that's fantastic news. And mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting, our first two guests mentioned that, uh, both the, the, the importance of regular screening mm -hmm. and, and the importance, importance of, of self-exams and yes. kind of and knowing your body, knowing which is, body. is very critical. Mm -hmm. So so it's good at getting the word out, and that's why this is so mm -hmm. important. And again, we appreciate you two being on the program to, to talk a little bit about this. So let's talk about different populations. You mentioned uh, specific types of, of breast cancer and, and, and one that hits African-American population a little bit harder. What's, what's the, the thought behind, uh, behind that? I don't know if there are any theories on, on that for either one of you might have, or, uh, and what kind of research is being done there? Well, it, it may be biological or genetic that contributes to these more aggressive uh, cancers, such as triple negative breast cancer, affecting the African American population. Um, <clears throat> it's key, really, to close the disparity gap, and part mm -hmm. of it is due to the fact that uh, there's more aggressive cancers, but we need to find better treatments for these particular subtypes. Yes, I think that uh, there are a number of different things contributing to the disparities between the African-American population and the white population. If you really look at mortality rates between those two populations, there's a 40% difference in mortality rates. And if you look at younger women, 50 mm -hmm. and under, it's even more pronounced. It's about a double of a mortality rate. And much of it, as Dr. Dolan said, is there are more aggressive cancers. Mm -hmm. Also, more women are diagnosed at an earlier age in African American population than in the white population. And then we have some structural issues too. Timing between getting a screening mammogram and then a follow-up mammogram right. to confirm is longer in the African American population and time to treatment is longer. Those things we can attack and the American Cancer Society, the University of Chicago and other partners are really looking at how we can shorten those times to help decrease the disparities with the African American population and the white population. And that goes back to some healthcare disparities mm -hmm. just in general mm -hmm. that we face and I, I know that mm -hmm. there is work being mm -hmm. done uh, here at UChicago Medicine for, for certain and also the American 
and Cancer yes. Society is helping with that work to try to try to battle some of that. And it's a it's a tough uh, tough topic. We are getting some questions from viewers, so I wanted to make sure we get to a couple sure. of those if we could. And and one of them, a pretty basic one, probably should have asked this uh, right off the bat. But what does a, sus a, sp a suspicious lump feel like? How, how does somebody know if something's out of the ordinary? Either one of you can take that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, through breast self-exams or through mammograms, it's mm -hmm. really important to continue to get screening. Um, and anything that feels sort of a little out of the ordinary would be worth checking up on. Mm -hmm. um, you really need to know your breasts, right? You really need to um, regularly, at the same time every month, look at your breasts, make sure that, look and um, be familiar with what they look like, what they feel like. It's hard to say this is exactly how, what something would feel like, but you know your own body and what's normal and what is something out of the normal. When it's out of the normal, you need to go to your doctor and have that conversation. I, I would say it, it's, probably best just to be careful and err on the side of caution exactly. or something like yes. this. If you yes. feel any kind of a lump, mm -hmm. um, go see your doctor because mm -hmm. that's that's the best thing to do. Absolutely. A quick visit will put your mind at ease and if there is something specific or something bigger happening, it's it's better Absolutely. to find it then. So, mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about, I, I'm, I'm very curious about your research and, and you were talking a little bit before the show, I don't know if you mm -hmm. can share some of that with our viewers, but you, you do some fascinating research, particularly on, on genetics. Right, mm -hmm. so in, in my uh, research, mm -hmm. we actually identify um, the contribution of genetics to the side effects of chemotherapy. So, you know, we inherit DNA from our mother and father, and that's throughout all the cells in our body, and that really dictates or predicts uh, which patients might be at risk for devastating, severe, long-lasting side effects. And they include uh, peripheral neuropathy might be one, uh, which many patients get. Um, it can be motor or sensory. There's also hearing loss and tinnitus. So in my research, we are looking at uh, younger populations that end up with maybe 50 or 60 years ahead of them, uh, which, have, which will be living with these uh, devastating side effects. And if you understand the genetics, you can begin to get at uh, new treatments or preventative uh, drugs for these side effects. So if, if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, should she be tested genetically to see if she has the likelihood of passing that along to a, a daughter or relative? Is that a so good that, idea? <clears throat> yes, that, um, that is definitely, if, they, um, if they're young at age and they have a first degree relative with breast cancer, they definitely need to be tested uh, for genetic mutations that may predict for breast cancer incidence. Dr. Brzezinski, could you talk to us just for a moment about the American Cancer Society and the important role that, that your organization plays with research? Um, because from a fundraising perspective, yes, that's, that's yeah. a big part Very of, big of part. what happens here. Yes, right now the American Cancer Society um, is funding 162 different studies across the country in breast cancer, um, investing a total of about $67 million, some of that right here at the University of Chicago. Um, it um, really discovery and um, advancement in treatment is so very critical in uh, in reducing, continuing to reduce mortality due to breast cancer. And so we, the funds that we raise um, obviously go towards education, awareness, they go towards working with our partners to increase screening, but so much of it also goes towards research to make certain that we are um, funding those critical uh, uh, studies that will lead to advances in breast cancer. And Dr. Dolan, I, I know you were talking earlier, the American Cancer Society is such a wonderful partner um, mm -hmm. with, with you and with the mm -hmm. university. In fact, some of your research was, was funded directly. Mm -hmm. Right. My very first grant came from the American Cancer Society, so thank you. Um, and uh, that was for a small, <laughs> it was a small grant for a very high risk project, mm -hmm. uh, but that led into a very large uh, project that was funded by the National Institute right. of Health. Uh, that went for five years and it really propelled my career. Mm -hmm. career. So I appreciate uh, that the American Cancer Society Thank funds <laughs> um, <laughs> risky projects yes, uh, that, I think that um, is one. NIH yeah. is more mm -hmm. reluctant to fund. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and I want to say those risky projects, those are critical mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. is where a lot of the a lot of the research that's mm -hmm. done in right. some of these risky projects turns out to be very beneficial absolutely. and it also leads to absolutely. some of the other research right. uh, that's, that's being done. Right, that's absolutely right. So that's great. Can you talk about researchers? 
that mm -hmm. initiative. Uh, it, it's 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 an interesting project, and I don't know mm -hmm. if either one of you can can, you can discuss well, it. Go ahead. Yeah, I know so you were an ambassador. Me, yeah. I was an ambassador. Go oh. ahead. <laughs> I'm part of Research Hers, and this yes. is uh, Empowers Women. Um, I noticed that they um, announced the Nobel Prize winners again this mm -hmm. year, and out of over 600 Nobel Prize uh, laureates, only 20 are women. Mm -hmm. um, I also just read a study where women are less likely to get, um, or they get about 40,000 less in their grants than men with all other things being equal. So it's time to empower women. And uh, I'm part of it to help other women researchers uh, because even if my lab doesn't come up with the cure or come up with some major breakthrough, I want to be part of that through uh, funding and uh, being an ambassador. Dr. Brzezinski? Yes, um, I was also an ambassador. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a really important, important um, effort that we really want to encourage and empower young women to really explore research and to um, move, go forward and um, study in sciences and, and join the research uh, community and to fun and what's very critical is that those scientists that are out there studying that they have the research funds to be able to continue their work and that's what researchers does it raises funds specifically for women doing research um, uh, doing cancer research so we're, we're about out of time in the program but I know I'm going to get in trouble by the people off camera if mm -hmm. I don't talk about one thing and that is making strides against yes. breast cancer <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I might get in trouble by the people on the camera, too. So we want to talk about that uh, October 19th, right? Yes. So we're, it's coming up and right. mm -hmm. very important. And it's yes. also a fun event. Yes. It's a great event. It's a really exciting event. We have actually we have actually making strides against breast cancer events across the country, 200 of them. But here in Chicago, there are seven of them in the community. Um, go to makingstrideswalk.org, put in your, your zip code and your city, and they'll tell you where these walks are. The October 19th walk, the one that Tim mentions, is the big one in Chicago. It's at Soldier Field. University of Chicago is the presenting sponsor. They're also sponsoring our Southside Walk. Um, come out. It's a great event. We honor survivors. We um, uh, uh, we obviously remember our loved ones lost with breast cancer. We increase awareness. There's music. There's a DJ. It's a good time. And we want to make it the biggest and the best that we've ever had. So October 19th at Soldier Field, Roz Barron and uh, wow. Judy Shu are the co-hosts uh, 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 of the event. Come out. You'll have a great time. Yeah, it is a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful event, and uh, we, we need lots of people there, so so please do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being on the program, both of you. Thank you very much. It's really much. wonderful. We are out of time. Uh, please remember to check out our Facebook page for future programs and other healthy living tips. Also, if you want more information about UChicago Medicine, you can take a look at our website at uchicagomedicine.org. And if you want specific cancer information, go to uchicagomedicine.org slash cancer to make an appointment, 855 702 Eight two two two. Thanks again for watching. Hope you have a wonderful week. Comer Children's Hospital at the University of Chicago Medicine is at the forefront of kids' health, shaping national standards of care from infants to young adults. Comer Children's, welcome to the forefront. <laughs>